a new book, great new book, detailing the behind the scenes on Capitol Hill during both of the impeachments of former President Donald Trump. It's called Unchecked, the untold story behind Congress's botched impeachments of Donald Trump. The book is out now. It shares harrowing details of closed door conversations among congressional leaders and the infighting within both the Democratic and Republican parties. One of the co-authors of this new terrific book, Karin Demergeron, joins us now. Karin is also a Washington Post national security reporter. So good to have you here. Thanks for having Congratulations me. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Unchecked. Thank you. It's done and it's great. <laughs> it is done. And we hope that people find it great. It was uh, there's so much in yeah. here. What stands out to you as the most surprising as someone who knows the national security world, knows Congress so well? When you had time to do a book, it gave you time to really dig in. What shocked you? What stunned you? Right. Well, I mean, what we did is we went back to the sources that had, we had been reporting on in real time and more um, and basically learned how many times there were very different things going on behind the scenes and what we were watching play out on the camera than the explanations that the principals, that the lawmakers were actually giving the country for what they were doing and their motivations for why. Um, we detail a lot of the book goes into, you know, the, the slow intra-fighting, party fighting in the Democratic Party to even get to impeachment in the first place. Nancy Pelosi, super resistant to that. She had come of age during the Clinton years, thought that impeachment could blow back on the impeacher and was afraid of launching a weapon that could turn into a boomerang and how she resisted for nine months before she embraced impeachment. Finally, after embracing impeachment the first time, tries to just get it over with really quickly. Um, but I think probably readers will find that the the real shocker, the, the, the even bigger shocker moments come in the second impeachment, that there was a moment on January 6th, um, you had the leaders of the both parties, the Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy, ready to ditch Trump, reaching out to their Democratic colleagues to say, we have to work together here. And you had some rank and file Democrats present Nancy Pelosi and her deputy, Steny Hoyer, with impeachment articles that night on January 6th, saying, let's do this now, while everybody feels the anger before they have a chance, before Republicans have a chance to politically think. And Pelosi said, no, thank you, and delayed it Why for several days. Why did she say days. that? What well, was that? Why at that crossroads did you make that decision based on your reporting? Well, based on our reporting, this kind of goes again towards Pelosi feeling like impeachment can be a live wire. Impeachment can be a very, very dangerous weapon to have to handle. And at that juncture, we were about two weeks away from the end of Trump's presidency. There was this feeling that why reopen Pandora's box? It didn't go so well the first time. Remember, after the first impeachment, President Trump's poll numbers were quite high. Um, he arguably might have won the election so had it taken point, place the right then. the first impeachment politically informed decisions made on the second impeachment. Right. And especially because they were eyeing the beginning of a Biden presidency. And I think a lot of people, Democrats certainly, but even the Republican leaders thought that they could put Trump in the rearview mirror. Very vain hopes that they were thinking that way, of course, because fast forward two years later, we're still talking about President Trump and we're still trying to investigate the events of that day on January 6th. I mean, there's another episode, really, in the second impeachment where um, during the trial, you have Jamie Raskin, who's actually a major player in both impeachments in this book in ways that people didn't realize he played a role. Jamie Raskin getting a vote on the Senate floor to call Republican witnesses. Uh, we document a scene where, you know, Jamie Herrera Butler, who was the person who let the country know about Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump's fight on January 6th, wakes up on the West Coast realizing that she, the the, the, uh, the prosecutors are trying to get her to testify, is scrambling on a Saturday morning of a long weekend to find a lawyer, calls Doug Letter, the House counsel, to say, what should I do? And he says, I can't advise you, but never passes on the message that she wants to do this to the actual prosecutors. And so they never know. And they're under tremendous pressure from the leaders of the Democratic Party to just get it over with so they can move on with the Biden agenda. And so thinking that it wasn't going to work, even though it was, like their, their witnesses, the GOP witnesses, were in the process of trying to get ready, they, they give up the fight. And now we are kind of in the last throes of the January 6th committee that's doing things so differently, of course, as we've seen, right? Running impeachment, running their subpoenas through the courts, pulling in witnesses from the GOP to make this case to try to convince the public. It's almost like a tacit admission that they had these opportunities back at the beginning of 2021. What about the opportunity and to, to get them? Republican votes? I want to give credit sure. as well to your co author, Rachel Bade, uh, both the authors of Unchecked. Great book. And I, you do wonder, and I would really be curious what you sure. found with your reporting here. Could they have won more Republican votes in the Senate trial? I mean, Trump's still on the scene now because he wasn't convicted in the Senate trial. When Democratic sources sit back and look back at the strategy, was there a different way they could have actually convicted Trump in the Senate? Democrats are very, look, 
Democrats are divided about this. There are Democrats that think that they should have swung with every punch, that they should not have pulled the punches when it came to chasing, issuing subpoenas and then fighting them out in court. This goes back to the John Bolton question of the first impeachment. And it definitely goes towards the question of whether they should have brought those Republicans like Mike Pence's aides in to testify. And yes, in the second impeachment, look, we go into deep backroom detail about Mitch McConnell and his wrestling with things. He, we, we know because he said publicly that he found Trump personally responsible for this, but that he couldn't, it was a moot point because, you know, oh, you can't convict a former president even if he was impeached when he was in office. Mitch McConnell did not believe that, according to our reporting. Mitch McConnell very much says very blankly behind closed doors to people, I know this is an excuse. This is a procedural off-ramp. And he's actually so said he thought he would destroy the party if he went too far he he in would that destroy direction? The party. Yes, but he was also in the process of trying to set up a way for him to be able to make the decision that would have said, yes, this is constitutional. He, he was going to pull in a, um, a, a Republican lawyer to argue the pro and the con of that argument. And he was going to do this very slowly and kind of he was setting up the chess pieces when Rand Paul swept in and forced a vote on the floor and the constitutionality and McConnell followed his party where they were. He didn't lead his party in a certain direction with his gut. He decided to stay. Look, McConnell likes to be the leader of the caucus, right? That's how he considers himself primarily sure. to be. And McConnell's not the only player, though. And looking ahead, I'd love to get your, sure. your big picture take on impeachments now. You've deeply yes. covered two impeachments. Yes. I spoke earlier today with Congressman Jim Banks, who may be in the House leadership mm -hmm. next year. He's talking about possible impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas. Oh, sure. Possible impeachment of President Biden. Yeah. Is it now a culture of impeachment on Capitol Hill? I mean, look, our reporting um, and various constitutional law uh, experts that we spoke to along the way suggest that we are in this position now where impeachment is no longer just a constitu the constitutional failsafe it was designed to be, but is turning into a weapon to express political animus of a higher order than your average everyday political fighting. Um, and look, for that, we just have to be clear about one thing. It, yes, you can argue about the merits of the, each impeachment case and how bad what Trump did um, or didn't. You, know, you, you can argue about the merits if you want to. But if you look at the, the rules of the, the structure of impeachment, the, the impeachment is the only oversight power that the Constitution explicitly gives to Congress. But it also doesn't say how to do it. It's all based on precedent. During the Nixon impeachment and the Clinton impeachment, you had bipartisan buy-in on the rules of the road. You had witnesses that were fought for. You had the courts verifying that the congressional subpoena means something. You didn't fight those fights in the Trump impeachment. It kind of, uh, it, it, now there's two models mm -hmm. for cutting those corners. And that just basically gives the GOP something to point to now, next, as they, you know, are going to have very politically divisive uh, cases that they're bringing against Biden. But they can point back and say, well, you didn't run all these things down. Why are you saying that our process is unfair? Well, you guys know one too. better to track it in the future yeah. than Rachel Bade we'll and Karin Demersion. We really appreciate you coming by to CBS News and sharing your insights.